thanks for coming and all sitting on the left except for you three there math computer science holding the flank on the right um, I'm Mike Hannon the interim provost and VPAA but most of you probably are aware of that um, today we have uh, Dr. Matt Tincani from Temple University who's going to talk about um, students that have uh, autistic spectrum disorders and basically give some background on what that means and then also how to uh, address that in the classroom environment and even outside of the classroom environment. Uh, I know this year I've had um, input, let's say, from uh, some faculty and other non-faculty about some interactions and issues they've had in working with some students that have had uh, ASD. Um, I myself did a, a guest lecture this fall in a class that had uh, an ASD uh, student in it and it was a, uh, a challenging class to present in and I wondered what does a faculty do when this occurs every single day of the week when they have this class? How do you really uh, deal with this appropriately? These students are, of course, members of uh, the university community, and they're here for an education. We just need to become better educated ourselves in terms of how do we respectfully work with them and how do we work with them in the context of other students in the classroom. And so I'm hoping that today's uh, workshop is at least the beginning of that conversation uh, Dr. Tincani is going to um, give us some background on that and uh, perhaps answer all of our questions so we never have to talk about it again and we'll all know <laughs> what to do, but that may not happen. And, uh, and so we may in the fall continue this conversation with some other forums so that we can continue to, to work on this um, issue. Uh, Julia Hammond, who's my uh, graduate assistant, is responsible for organizing most of the events, so thank you very much, Julia, did a, did a great job with that. She's also passed out some um, green forms, which are assessment forms for today's presentation, so before you leave, if you could complete that and either leave it with me or with uh, Julia, we'd be interested in your input, and also at the end of that form, is a space uh, for suggestions for future uh, professional development workshops. If there are other things that you think that we should be having in this type of a form, if you could list those so we can look at doing that also in the future. Uh, we currently have uh, this year 19 students who are registered with OSD with um, autism, autism spectrum disorder, but we also have 64 students with primary mental health issues and uh, 25 additional students with secondary mental health issues, a lot of which will likely can be addressed in a similar way to what we're going to talk about um, here today. Uh, and so with no further, let me talk a little bit more about Matt, sorry Matt. Oh sure. No Besides problem. being from Temple, uh, Matt has his PhD in special education and applied behavior analysis from uh, The Ohio State University. <laughs> Uh, I think lost in basketball. Yeah. We can, but that's all right. It's, and it's, it's he okay. He has an MED in applied behavioral <clears throat> analysis from Temple University. Uh, I made the mistake of printing out his uh, CV and found out it was almost 20 pages long. Uh, it was too late. It was already coming out. <laughs> but uh, he also has more than 40 referee journal articles in this field, among many other accomplishments um, in this area. And so please help me in welcoming Matt Tincani. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the excellent introduction, Dr. Hannon. <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me here to Edinburgh University to talk about students with autism spectrum disorders in higher education, uh, reasonable accommodations and effective supports. So, I figured there would be a fairly diverse audience here today, so I, I'm going to start with kind of a broad overview of autism spectrum disorders, what ASDs are, according to both the current DSM-4 criteria, that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fourth edition, revised, um, 
which is the manual that clinicians use to diagnose a uh, ASDs and other mental disorders. And also in, I believe, I think the current date is May, next month, there's gonna be a new edition of the DSM, DSM that will come out, the DSM-5, and there's gonna be a change in the diagnostic criteria for ASD that you may have heard about. So we'll talk about how things are going to be a little bit different and how that might impact particularly individuals on the higher end of the spectrum. Then I'm gonna, we're gonna sort of get into how the characteristics of ASD impact students in college courses. And both broadly speaking, how do the main diagnostic features of ASD, problems in communication, social interaction, and repetitive behavior, how do those impact students' ability to do well in courses? And, how, and specifically, what are some things you might expect to see from students with ASD in your courses? And then we're going to get into universal design strategies to support students. And we're going to approach this with sort of a prevention logic. And I'm going to talk about helping students with ASD in the context of prevention logic and something called positive behavior support. Raise your hand if you've heard of positive behavior support. Okay, so a few people have, probably those of you in maybe in education or special education have heard of it, but it's a very useful heuristic to think about our, our students. We're going to talk a little bit about reasonable accommodations. What are reasonable accommodations and what are some specific examples for students who are on the spectrum? <clears throat> and then finally, we're going to get into some specific troubleshooting strategies for students with ASD who are running into problems, either in, in, in courses or in other areas of, of college life. And then we'll conclude there, we'll do, a, we'll do an activity, and then we'll hopefully have some opportunity for questions and, and further discussions. So again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Hannon and Edinburgh for inviting me to come here. This is a really wonderful opportunity, and what I, re what I really appreciate about this, um, being invited here, is that there's a commitment at the upper level of your administration to supporting, certainly supporting students with disabilities, but particularly students with ASDs. And I think that that's a, a great thing that you don't necessarily have at every university. So things in, in colleges and universities t tend to kind of, initiatives kind of trickle down from the top. So you've got some good support at the top. And since we're a pretty small group, if you want to, if you want to just kind of raise your hand to ask a question during the presentation, that that's fine. I think, I think I, I can hopefully answer your questions and then still move through with the content. So a little bit about me. So at Temple University, I'm <clears throat> my faculty appointment is in the special education program in the College of Education, and I'm also the coordinator of a graduate program in applied behavior analysis, or rather graduate programs. So we have a master's degree program in applied behavior analysis, and we also have a graduate certificate program in applied behavior analysis. And then in addition to that, I'm also the point person for a master's endorsement in autism. So I wear a few different hats at, at Temple. I'm both uh, a professor and I, I teach courses. I've been teaching for about, I've been teaching uh, at the university level for 12 or, or, th or 13 years, I think. I've been a, been a professor for, for 11. And uh, so I also work in the field of, of ASD as a, as a researcher. And at one time, I was a teacher and a practitioner. So I've worked with people with autism who are from two years old to probably in their 50s or, or 60s, and have pretty extensive experiences supporting adults um, on the spectrum as well. I started working in the field of autism when I was 19 years old. And when I was, a college, when I was in college, I became aware of uh, a program locally that was doing home-based therapy with very young kids with autism using something called applied behavior analysis. Raise your hand if you've heard of, of applied behavior analysis, OK? So at that time, applied behavior analysis was only starting to become a very popular approach used with young children with, with autism. 
And subsequently, there's been a number of fairly large research studies that have come out that have shown that if young kids get early intensive behavioral interventions based in applied behavior analysis, they have a much better chance of um, achieving a normal IQ or being fully included in mainstream inclusionary classrooms and schools. But of course, that's, that's, those interventions primarily address very young children. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, interventions for adults with ASD have been relatively neglected, un unfortunately. Um, so I've been working in the field for a long time. I think before I got into autism and special ed and, and ABA, I think my last job I was a dishwasher or a cook. So I always like I always joke that if I get out of this field, I don't really I I guess I would have to go back to that because I don't really know how to do anything else at this point. <clears throat> so so that's a little bit about me. <clears throat> How about you? Um, so raise your hand if you are a professor or instructor faculty person here at the university. Okay. If I could just ask a couple of people to share what department or program that you're, you're in. Okay, great. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay. Okay, great. Geosciences. A couple, a couple of other folks. Okay, English and theater. Great. A, a special ed in early childhood. Nursing. Okay, wonderful. So we have a good diverse group. And raise your hand if you're with the Office for Students with Disabilities. Okay, so hi. We we met at lunch. Good to good to see you. Uh, residence life. Uh, and, and how about others who, you've, if you haven't raised your hand? Okay, so the Academic Success Center, that's probably like a temple we call our teaching and learning center. So, I don't know, maybe it's something that's different. So, explain what your office does. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, great, great. That's excellent. So I have a little little piece in my presentation at, about advising strategies for students with ASD. So hopefully you'll find that to be relevant. Um, other folks, huh? Student affairs. student affairs. Okay, great. Campus life. Student teaching. Student teaching. Okay, so, so for people who are students who are going to be teachers. Okay, great. Library. Library services. Okay, wonderful. Well, it's a very diverse group and I'm hoping that each of you will find something that's not just generally applicable but something that will specifically help you with your with your job <clears throat> and so I understand that overall here at Edinburgh you have very good supports in place for students with disabilities and that you've even been recognized um, for the high level of accessibility of your campus and, and that's and that's wonderful um, and although it sounds to me like you don't have a, um, a program in place specifically for students with ASD. You do, of course, accommodate all students um, who have documented uh, disabilities in addition to being an, an accessible campus. And again, I think it's really um, wonderful that you're inviting somebody like me here to talk about autism and how you can better support your students. So I talked with Dr. Hannon a little bit about kind of his reason for wanting me to, to come here today, but maybe if I could hear a little bit from you about what you, maybe what you perceive to be your your strengths as as a university in supporting students with disabilities and ASD, but maybe also what you consider to be issues you have, concerns you have, um, so that we can maybe talk about those things going forward. I don't want to have like because our time is somewhat limited. I don't want to have a, a, su a super long open discussion, but I would just like to hear a few a few things, concerns or or, or issues perhaps. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. So, okay, good. Well, good for you. And, and I, I applaud you for being here. I think, I think that's wonderful. Um, so interpersonal interactions with students can be challenging sometimes. Um, helping, students to, helping students to help themselves and to, and to get relevant information, or you probably deal with things like registration, course registration issues, um, just kind of helping students navigate the whole, co the whole college system. Um, how do you know that this, this, these students have autism spectrum disorder or Asperger syndrome? They tell you, or, or you just make it, or you just sort of know? Okay. Okay. Oh boy, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so it sounds like you did some problem solving on the fly. That's you know kind of one characteristic of individuals on the spectrum when their routine is thrown off in, in, in a certain way, um, which I think losing something that's valuable is kind of an instance of that. It can kind of throw everything else off. And so um, you sort of helped her with a, with a problem solving strategy for that, and that, that was really wonderful. Um, and we'll get more into that. How about anybody else? Any other issues that you've seen? Or, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Good. Good. And one, you know, I mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about this and kind of um, in the within the framework of positive behavior support and from a prevention perspective. And what I would encourage, you know, those of you who are in, in administration, administrative positions as well as instructors to sort of look at ways that you can structure your class from the beginning in order to prevent problems from occurring. And the more we focus on things like good universal design and good instruction and good advising, the less likely we are to have to put out fires later on. And so, I mean, the example that you were talking about, the student loses her earring, well, it's hard to know how we could pre prevent a situation like that. And with a, student, with a student who loses it in that type of situation, that probably involves, that's a student who's probably going to need some pretty intensive individualized supports for how to cope in situations like that, because that student has not learned over the years how to cope in, in, that, in that type of situation. But beyond those type of crisis um, scenarios, there are probably things that we can do to prevent students from having problems in a lot of situations where they're likely to, they might otherwise encounter them. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the history of autism. So uh, the term autism was actually coined by Eugene Bluer in the early part of the 20th century, although at that point the, the term wasn't connected to our contemporary definition of autism as such. <clears throat> and he, he sort of got it from the, the, the Greek word meaning self or of the self. Autism was first formally identified as the disorder we understand it today by Leo Kanner, who was a psychologist working, or I'm sorry, a psychiatrist working at Johns Hopkins uh, University. And he wrote a book called Autistic Disturbances of Effective Contact, which is basically a description of 11 boys who displayed these odd, fairly odd and unique characteristics. They had difficulty with communication. They, in, in, in many cases, they didn't speak at all. If they did speak, their speech was telegraphic or it was much below where it should have been for their age level. They tended to want to be alone, 
or if they wanted to interact with people, it wasn't in the sort of typical manner that a person would want to interact with somebody. Like maybe if they wanted something, they would grab someone's sleeve and pull them towards it to get it for them. But they wouldn't otherwise ask for it or make eye contact. And they engaged in repetitive, stereotyped behaviors, such as rocking or humming and so forth. Now, you may not see these behaviors, or at least behaviors at that extreme level, with the students that you're working with and supporting and, and teaching, but you will likely see some perhaps mild, my, more mild version of them in the students that you're working with. So individuals with severe autism, they might engage in stereo, repetitive behaviors like stereotypic rock, rocking or flapping their hands. Individuals with high functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome, they may engage in repetitive behaviors, but they're likely to look a little bit different. Does anybody have an idea of what a repetitive behavior might look like in a person with high functioning autism in a, in a college classroom? Think about, okay, good. Yeah, may, yeah, you might see the, some of those repetitive or stereotype behaviors. I'm thinking more about like conversation topics or interests. Some of you are kind of shaking your head. So what are you thinking about? OK, video games. So higher individuals with higher functioning autism tend to stay fixated on certain, certain topics. Um, video games, other ones, music. Sounds in the subway in Pittsburgh, um, cell phone antennas, um, particular kinds of sports topics. Um, I, I, a young man with Asperger's syndrome who, who I knew was very interested in the weather, but it wasn't like the weather like the kind of casual co conversation that most people have about the weather, like, oh, hey, it's really sunny today or it's cold. You would walk into a room, and he'd learned how to, he had figured out at least how to, how to initiate, how to greet you appropriately, and like how to say hello. He'd kind of, you know, he'd sort of worked on that, so he'd say, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. And then he would proceed into a diatribe about, about not just a very in-depth diatribe about the weather. Like there's a high pressure system over the Midwest. It's going to be slowly moving east. It was almost like you were talking to a weatherman. He could just give you very great deal of detail about the weather. This is not all bad. Why is this not all bad? Because th this type of obsession can translate into passion about things. And people with autism, uh, and I'm particularly thinking of um, folks in academia that I've come across over the years, they get very passionate and very fixated and very perseverant about, about uh, a particular topic or a particular area, and they really they really stick with it, and it's really, really a great thing if we can encourage students or if we can support them in such a way that they're able to pursue their, pa their, their passions. So it's not all bad, and if we look at it from a strength-based perspective, it can be a good thing. Hans Asperger was the first one to describe a, a group of individuals who were a little bit different than Kanner's group of young children with autism. They, they uh, his group, had issues with social interaction and also with repetitive behaviors. They had fixated interests, but their language was at at least an average, if not above average level, in the sense that they could talk and, and, and they, had, they had learned to read and write at grade level, at least, but they had difficulty with the other, other um, aspects of social interaction and repetitive behavior. And today we call that Asperger's syndrome. So in the 40s to 60s, after Kanner's initial work in the 1940s, um, the psychodynamic view of autism predominated. And in the psychodynamic view of autism, there was a particular person or people who were to blame for the child developing autism. And if you know anything about, about Freud um, and things like you know the Oedipus complex and, and so forth, it was. Uh, there was a, a, a psychiatrist named Bruno Bettelheim who worked out of the University of Chicago who popularized the term refrigerator mother. And so it was thought that, that autism, because individuals with autism were sort of socially isolated, that this was a product of indifferent parenting. 
um, that the parents and mothers were cold and unloving and the fathers were professionals who were, who were often not interacting with, with their kids in a, a loving way. And this was partially supported by the fact that autism was largely identified in sort of upper middle class educated families. Although we know today that socioeconomic status and parents' education, that those things don't relate to autism at all. After this period, <clears throat> and then it, it, one important, this is sort of tangential, but related to the psychodynamic view, this sort of spawned sort of like wacky, some, some wacky therapies. For, for lack of a better word, that st and, and people on the autism spectrum and parents still fall prey to these kinds of strange therapies. So, you know, there's primal scream therapy. Um, there are, you know, if you go on the internet, if you, if you do a Google search and you type in autism therapy, you get all sorts of strange things like creams and lotions, um, lasers, hyperbaric ox oxygen therapy. Raise your hand if you've heard of that one. HBOT therapy, that's a very, actually quite a very popular one. Um, so there, if, if something, if you hear about a treatment and it sounds strange to you, it's probably very strange and doesn't work. Um, in the 70s, autism was recognized as a brain disorder with a genetic basis. So during this time, researchers began to understand that there was something going wrong in the brain that was causing children to have autism and there was probably a genetic basis to it. How did they figure out that it was genetically based? Well, they did studies of twins and found that if you have a set of identical twins, even ones who are reared apart, that if one twin has autism, the other one is much more likely to have autism than the general population. And then with fraternal twins, the relationship, the, the genetic relationship decreases a little bit, but it's still much higher than the general population. And so autism has a tendency to run in families. <clears throat> In the 80s and 90s, applied behavior analysis, which I mentioned earlier, emerged as the most scientifically validated treatment for autism. But again, this is an intervention that, though the principles of ABA can be applied with kids across the lifespan, it's most effective when it's implemented with very, very young children. And many of the folks that we work with really haven't had the opportunity to benefit from ABA because it just wasn't popular at the time or as popular at the time when they were young. Today, we are focused on researchers. Are, and there's a lot of money from the government and from private research sources focused on understanding the neuro neurobiology or etiology of autism, what causes autism towards prevention. There's a heavy emphasis on early intensive behavioral interventions, although adult interventions have unfortunately been neglected. And we're beginning to see that change. But <clears throat> for the most part, the research has been very focused on prevention, cure. Um, has anybody heard of the organization called Autism Speaks? It's a popular charity. It was founded by Bob Wright and his wife. Uh, Bob is or was the CEO of NBC, I say Bob like I know him. I don't, I don't, know, who we have, I, I don't know who he is. We've never met, but, but um, they're out there um, a lot. But they're, they really focus heavily on funding kind of, kind of um, cause and cure type research. But we're relatively far away from that. I mean, we're nowhere near. We're decades away from a, a, from a pill, essentially. Um, we're getting closer to be, being able to diagnose it in very young children, which is a great thing, but we're still relatively far away from, from curing it. So what is autism? Well, it's a complex array of behavioral excesses and deficits, and it's a spectrum of behaviors. And the, the people with autism spectrum disorder share a lot of things in common. They're each individual. And the way autism looks in one student is going to be very different than the way it looks in another student. The three main areas that are affected in autism are communication, social interaction, and repetitive stereotyped behaviors, restricted interests. Issues with communication. For the individuals that you're supporting, problems in communication, you, you, if somebody you know, gets, gets into the university and they're taking university courses, intellectually, they're at least at the average level, if not at the above average level or the way above average level. 
So those aren't the kinds of problems with communication that we're, that we're talking about. The issues with communication we're talking about are things like how to have a productive communication and social interaction with a professor or with other students. How to get along in a group project. How to get along with your roommate. How maybe not to be the most popular student in, around, but how to have a good group of, of close friends and to be accepted. Um, but particularly in, for in instructors, you're concerned about appropriate interactions with other students, and you're concerned with appropriate and productive interactions with you as the professor. Communication and social interaction really go hand in hand. Because along with communication, there are a variety of verbal and, and, and nonverbal skills that you have to be able to do successfully. You have to know how, how, um, how appropriate or, or how far away uh, or what distance you should maintain from somebody when you're speaking to them. So if you've just met somebody and you get up with, in their space like this, right, which students with ASD will sometimes do, and you go, whoa, that's not, that's not an appropriate distance. Um, also, being able to have a reciprocal interaction. Sometimes with people on the spectrum, when they're having a conversation with somebody, it's almost like the other person is just an occasion for them to speak. You know what I mean? But there isn't really a good reciprocal interaction going on there. That's also a, a key part of social interaction and communication. So these are just some of the issues. Repetitive stereotype behaviors and restrictive interests, and we've heard a couple of, of examples. Um, students may get very, very fixated on a topic, or they, may, they, they might just get really fixated on a particular project or a grade they got, or I had a student who, he was a brilliant, he was a brilliant student, and he was just, he knew the subject matter top and, and, and bottom, and he was, I, I gave an exam, and the exam maybe had like 30 questions on it or something, and he handed it in, and he had gotten to question five, and he stopped, right? And, and so, of course, he, he failed. And, and later on, I, you know, I, I graded it, and I said, you know, can, I, can I talk with you? And I asked him about it. And I said, what, what happened here? He said, Dr. Tincani, when you presented this in class, this is how you said the sentence, blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. But on the test, the sentence says, blah, 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 but blah, 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 blah. So I changed and to but. And it completely threw him off. And he stayed on that one particular question and tried. He, you know how sometimes students will just they'll, they'll real, try really, really hard when you give a, like a multiple choice test. They'll try really hard to sort of figure it out. And, they, and he did that for the whole class period. And he, never, and, and he just never got, got to the rest of the questions. So that getting kind of fixated on something, that's a part of repetitive or stereotype behaviors. Other characteristics can include things like sensory issues. So sensory issues, what do you think that might look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, certain, it might be certain pitches, people talking, um, lights, being in rooms with a lot of people and being crowded. Um, these things can be issues. I mean, like I, another, one young man couldn't, I, I, I knew, worked with, couldn't wear jeans. Why? It wasn't because, it wasn't for fashion. He just didn't like the way they felt on his legs. They felt funny. So that's an example of a sensory issue. Feeding problems, that's something typically, well, you might see this in older individuals in that they're very, very, very picky about the kinds of foods they eat. But feeding is called over-selectivity. Um, oftentimes, young children with autism will just like, they'll get really, really, um, they'll, they'll only eat like three different foods. You might have a kid who like, likes potato chips, but like he only likes, do you have hers potato chips here? He only likes hers potato chips. And even if you give him a chip that he can't see the bag and you think it's a hers potato chip, it's like one, but it's, it's not actually hers potato chip, he'll push it away. Those kinds of issues, which again comes back to these problems with repetitive behaviors. 
People oftentimes will ask about savants or, or quote, autistic savants. And these would be people with autism who have very, very special abilities. I mean, the most famous example is fictional. It's um, uh, Dustin Hoffman's character in Rain Man. This, you know, who could count and people that have, like, you know, you always, you're hearing things in the news. You know, whenever I tell people, oh, it's like I work with, you know, people with autism, they say, oh, yeah, I was watching a news show, and there's this, there's this guy who can, like, he, you know, he can just look at a picture of a city from, like, an airplane view, and then he can go and he can, he can paint it or he can draw it, like, from visual memory. That type of skill is pretty rare. Savant skills are very rare. So in other words, if you have a student with autism in your, class, in your classes, you should, not you should not expect them to be brilliant. Okay? They will not necessarily be a brilliant student. People with autism have what we call splinter skills. And that is they're oftentimes very good at some things, and then they're kind of at average levels or maybe even below average levels with, with other things. So you might have students who have very good spatial skills, or you might have students who have very, very, very good um, math computation skills. But they're not necessarily going to be above average in every area. So I don't want you to expect that you know, you're going to get, you've, someone in your class has autism, that he's going to be a brilliant person, not necessarily. Prevalence of autism has gone up substantially in recent, in recent decades. When I first got into the field, <clears throat> they said, well, between maybe 10 to 15 in every 10,000 uh, individuals had autism. And the most recent figures released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is something like 1 in 88 um, individuals on the spectrum have uh, or there are one, in, one, in individual, one in 88 individuals have an autism spectrum disorder. So it's gone up substantially. Much more prevalent in boys than girls, maybe 2 to 1 or 3 to 1, boys to girls. <clears throat> so the prevalence has increased, and we don't exactly know why that is. According to the DSM-4, that's the... Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of Mental Disorders is kind of this book that psychologists would use to diagnose um, autism. Autism falls with, within pervasive developmental disorder. So <clears throat> we have autistic disorder, Asperger's syndrome, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, or PDD NOS which is kind of atypical autism. This is when somebody doesn't quite meet the diagnostic criteria for autism or Asperger's syndrome. Because for example, they might have the behavioral characteristics of autism, but they come along a little bit later in life. Or they come along, that well, for someone to get diagnosed with autism, the symptoms have to be present before they're three. But maybe a child sh doesn't show the symptoms before three, maybe they're four or five. They would get a diagnosis of PDD NOS. The last two, Rett syndrome and childhood disintegrative disorder, are actually very different than autism. And in the new version of the DSM, they're not going to be considered to be autism spectrum disorders. It's the, really the first three that we're most concerned with. Autistic disorder, Asperger disorder, or PDD-NOS. So if you're working with a student, they may, uh, they're, they're I don't know if they're more or less likely to have a diagnosis of Asperger versus autism. Probably they're more likely to have a diagnosis of Asperger syndrome, but they might also have a diagnosis of PDD-NOS. Has anybody encountered that with a student in college, PDD-NOS? Okay. Right. That's right, correct, yes. So we'll, and we'll talk about that a, a, a little bit later. We'll, we'll get into that. Right. Right, sure, right. And if, yeah, and I mean, if you, spend, if, you, if you have some awareness of the characteristics and you've spent some time around individuals on the spectrum, you can, I think in many cases, you can figure it out. So that's just um, sort of a metaphor. It's kind of the umbrella of autism. <clears throat> so with the new version of the DSM-5 that's going to come out in May, there are some pretty significant changes to the way autism is going to be diagnosed. So the new DSM is getting rid of the term uh, Asperger's syndrome. It's not going to be in the new version of the DSM, um, nor is the term just plain autism. 
<clears throat> there's going to be one term, autism spectrum disorder. And they're going to go from three categories of impairment to two. So they're combining social and communication deficits into one kind of subcategory, social communication deficits. And then fixated interests and repetitive behaviors. What's the rationale for combining social deficits with communication deficits? Well, I guess it's that communication and social interaction are pretty much, they occur simultaneously. In order to communicate with somebody, in order to communicate, you've got to be interacting with somebody, right? So that's why those two have been sort of moved together. And then we still have repetitive interests and fixated interests and repetitive behaviors. Autism is going to be def uh, defined <clears throat> Um, on a continuum of symptoms, ranging from most severe, but of course, and then if somebody doesn't quite meet the threshold for the diagnostic criteria, but they maybe have some, we could call them autistic tendencies, they would sort of be at the subclinical level of autism, and then of course there's normal variation. So we all engage in repetitive behaviors, right? We do. In fact, I'm trying to look around for some right now. I can't fully see people, but so when I'm sitting in a lecture, I have a tendency to, to kind of do stuff like this and to sort of fidget a little bit. Well, this is repetitive behavior, but it's pro hopefully, maybe, within the norm normal variation of repetitive behavior. Um, people, with, w people who don't have autism can display any of these characteristics. It's when they occur to such a degree that they interfere with the person's life and functioning that it becomes an autism spectrum disorder. There have been some concerns expressed about the new DSM-5 category, and frankly, I don't have any good answers for the problems that have been raised. One of the concerns is that by removing the Asperger syndrome diagnosis that suddenly people who now have Asperger syndrome, it won't be recognized anymore. They won't, um, they won't, individuals who have Asperger syndrome in, won't be able to get the diagnosis in the future and won't be able to get services. And overall, because they're making the criteria, criteria for the diagnosis higher, there's concern that fewer individuals will get the diagnosis overall. And there have been researchers who've looked at this. So they've taken a group of individuals and they've applied the, the, the fourth edition diagnostic criteria and the fifth edition diagnostic criteria. And frankly, the results of those studies are very mixed. And one problem with interpreting them is that if you look at one study, they use this set of diagnostic instruments. And then if you look at it, and they f have one finding, and then if you look at another study, they use different diagnostic instruments. So they're using different procedures to diagnose, and it's very hard to compare. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure how this is going to, um, how this is going to work out. There are a lot of people who have Asperger's syndrome who call themselves Aspies, and they affiliate with it. They consider it to be a, a positive part of their identity. So they're understandably upset that this is going away. Um, but I think that just my read of the new DSM-5 criteria suggests that it looks to me like it's still, that they're reasonable enough that most folks who would get diagnosed now would be able to be diagnosed in the future. That's just my general read, but I think more research will need to be done to really bear this out. Okay. Any questions about just the general characteristics of people with with autism before we move into talking about supporting students um, with autism and some specific strategies there. Any, any just general questions about characteristics? OK, good. <clears throat> As we're thinking about helping students with autism, I think it's first beneficial to think about <clears throat> what are the characteristics of good or great students? And how do we get students with autism to that level? Or maybe what things the students with autism lack that they need to be at that level? Well, great students are motivated and self-starters, right? They, <clears throat> they study regularly. School is a priority. They're interested in the subject matter. 
I can't tell you how many times I've felt offended, and talking with my colleagues, they've felt offended when students are not as passionate about their, our subject matter as we are. But of course, in reality, we know that there's you know stu students who end up in our classes, especially those of us who teach at the undergraduate level, who teach those more introductory courses, there are students there who just don't really care that much about, well, name, name the subject, um, spe in special education. Um, <clears throat> but really great students love, they're, they're passionate about it, they're interested in it, they love it, they want to make it their career, they want to drop everything else they're doing and study, and study it, right? They participate during class. Right? So we don't have to like, you know, they, they eagerly raise their hands, they ask questions, they make thoughtful, intelligent, insightful comments, they add to the discussion. We could sit down and they could teach the class for us, they love it so much and they're so fluent with it. I'm using a little, a little hyperbole here, I hope you, I hope you get that. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I'm being a little bit facetious here too because I think sometimes we professors have really high expectations for what we want. For, we, for what we want from our students, and sometimes we have to do a little more to get them there. <clears throat> Excellent verbal and written communication. They write well. I have, to, I, I have to make a confession to you. Several years ago, I stopped giving essay assignments, and I stopped giving essay tests because I just, got, I just couldn't grade them any, anymore. It didn't have anything to do with, like, um, it, w it wasn't really instructional, like it wasn't that much of an instructional decision, like I thought it was making me that much of a better teacher, I just thought I can't grade these things anymore, I just can't do it, it gives me a headache. But sometimes we have students who are really great writers and that's a good thing. Students meet course expectations, they complete assignments well and on time, and they self-advocate. What do you think I mean by self-advocate? They're good self-advocates. Mm -hmm. Good, yes, right? So maybe the student, it's the student who comes to your office hours at the beginning of the semester and he, intro he introduces himself and he says, oh, I, just, I, I, I was looking at the assignments and the student asks good clarifying questions and says, you know, what do I need to do to be successful in your course, right? Or... Um, as opposed to the student who doesn't, who doesn't do particularly well and then doesn't do anything about it, right? And then continues not to do well and then stops coming to class. We want students to be good self-advocates. And part of being a good self-advocate is understanding your own learning style and your strengths and your weaknesses and then how to advocate yourself accord, accordingly to do well and perform well in the course. So we want students like that too. College students with ASD are often very passionate about their subject matter and what they want to do in life and the direction that they want to go. <clears throat> often they have a very good work ethic and they try very hard when they understand the expectations. <clears throat> so when the expectations are clear, they get it. And they thrive in environments of structure and clear expectations. But when any of these things are missing, when they may not be particularly passionate about the subject matter, or the subject matter might be in a sort of abstract area that they may not, they maybe really don't get as much. If it's a, if it's a literature course, for example, that involves <clears throat> abstract inter inferring meanings and metaphors and things like that, they don't really get it. Or with professors who are sort of very unstructured in the way they teach and with their expectations, they may struggle with that as well. Um, but when they have these things in place, they can do very good. <clears throat> so some specific characteristics of students with ASD that might affect their performance in college courses. So, and, and these sort of, We'll tie these back to the basic characteristics of ASDs, deficits in communication, social interaction, or repetitive behaviors. So, difficulty when the, ex the expectations are not explicitly spelled out. So when there are assignments given where it's not 
exactly spelled out what they need to do to get the grade. And we'll talk about that in some more detail in a bit. Asking questions or seeking assistance from the instructor in, in an inappropriate way, and I'll skip down one, communicating and inter interacting with other students productively because I think they're related. So knowing how to get the instructor's assistance or to how, knowing how to communicate with the instructor in an appropriate way. So what do you think would be an example of inappropriate communication with an, with an instructor? And you might think back to your, you know, some of your interactions and some of you are smiling. Yeah, so, right, yeah, so some students with, with ASD might be reticent to communicate at all. They, they, may not, they may not openly communicate in class because social situations, group social situations particularly, they make them uncomfortable. And you might have other students who blurt out answers just freely because, again, they're relatively insensitive to the social rules that in social conventions that are in place in situations. So they might just kind of over, over participate. They may, their, their written communication, which in these days is email or if you do discussion boards in, in your classes, their written communication might be really inappropriate, right? So they might just, you know, one thing I've seen is just like, you know, no, there's no salutation and it, it can change if, if you want to get someone to do something or if you have a question for somebody, you'll greatly increase your chances of getting compliance from them if you say, hello, so-and-so. Could you do me this favor? Thank you so much. I appreciate that, right? Social niceties, like people with autism, they just don't like, they want to communicate the message. It's like, here's what I need. Here's what I want, right? And they come off as what? Rude. Yeah, but they don't. But see, the thing about autism is, are they really rude? Like, you know, I mean, you've had like the, you know, we know like the jerks, right? Whether they're our students or whether they're uh, colleagues, you know, we understand the people who like, they want to be malevolent, right? It's not usually that. It's just that they don't get it. They don't know that they're being rude because they struggle with social convention. That's when, it, and that's why it's important that if you're an advisor or if you're a professor to give that suggestion. Say, you know, this would really come across to me. This would really come across, I think. The, the, the people, people like it when you say thank you in an, in an email or when you say hello in an email. It makes it more likely that someone's going to get your message. Someone's going someone's to respond to you. Someone's going to listen to you. So sometimes we just need to provide that explicit help. <clears throat> Understanding their own learning strategies and, and needs. And again, this goes back to being an effective self-advocate. <clears throat> Knowing that maybe time management isn't your greatest strength. So you need to maintain a schedule and write down when your classes are during the week. Right? Knowing that sometimes you need extra time in between your classes to just kind of you know, cool down and, and collect, right? as opposed to scheduling three consecutive classes starting at 8 o'clock in the morning, three days a week, right? Knowing those kinds of, knowing your own learning strategies and needs, that's all very important stuff. Participating in class productively and understanding others' points of view. That, or even the notion that other people might have a different point of view can sometimes be a struggle. Repetitive and restricted behavior, so difficulty with unexpected changes in course assignments, Schedules and grading expectations can be a tough thing. People with autism spectrum disorder like routines. They like for things to go a certain way. And if things don't go that way, kind of, kind of throw things off. I mean, I've seen this in young kids where it's like th there's an assembly that's unscheduled. And boo! And it just, the throw, they have a tantrum, right? Or there's a doctor's appointment, right? Um, in, in higher ed classrooms, this might occur if there's a change in the course schedule or the instructor changes the assignment somehow. Um, and the key, the key here, of course, there are going to be things that happen that are that just happen and they can't be that, that can't be avoided. But the key as much as possible is maintaining predictability when the schedule is going to change or if there's going to be a change, 
communicating it as far in advance as you possibly can and trying to communicate, communicate it with students in advance. Um, maintaining interest and motivation in areas of non-interest. Sometimes people on the spectrum, they get so focused on the things that they're into that they sort of don't necessarily care about other things. Um, which is why when you're advising them, it's if you can, to the extent possible, do an inventory of you know, maybe the subjects that they did well in in high school and try to match them to courses that might be in their interest area. Um, courses that require hab higher uh, abstract or higher order thinking can be very difficult for them as well because they tend to think very concretely. Sensory issues, so as we talked about, you know, a, 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 a phys do, do undergraduate students at this university have to take physical education electives? Okay, so this is not a much of an issue, but they did it one time, right? So a class that's in a noisy gymnasium, um, students with Asperger's syndrome oftentimes have um, mo issues with um, motor clumsiness and problems with gross motor skills. There's a young man with, with Asperger's syndrome I, I worked with who, he, he, when we were walking somewhere, he would always follow directly behind me. And sometimes he would give me flats. He would step on the backs of my feet. And I was just, you know, why, you know, it's like, why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? And over, over time, I, I realized he was walking, he, he walked directly behind me because he had motor clumsiness issues and he would oftentimes trip on the sidewalk. It, because he couldn't really tell where there might be uneven areas that would make him trip. And so he followed directly behind me because he knew that was the safe way to walk. Um, so a student like this in a physical education class, I mean, it could potentially be, be a problem if not a disaster because that student's not necessarily going to be able to um, compete. And also just, you know, team sports, not necessarily um, a great thing for these students. So. We've talked a lot about the characteristics of autism, and so I want to do a little activity to think, pair, share. You don't necessarily have to get into groups of two. You could get into groups of three or more. That's fine. <clears throat> so Dr. Ramirez, a professor of communication studies, assigns students a group project in which they must analyze a movie and write a collective paper on how the movie demonstrates principles of interpersonal communication. Students are expected to meet outside of class to work on the project to share paper documents on Google Docs, and to have discussions about the paper on Blackboard. I don't think you have Blackboard here. It's, the unit, it's a, like an online course delivery system. What's it called here? What is it? D2L. So it's like D2L, right? And then students are given a final grade based on the quality of their discussions and the collective final paper. So take a mo moment to read that. So given the characteristics of students with ASD that we've discussed, what kinds of problems could students with ASD encounter with this assignment? And how could Dr. Ramirez structure the assignment? Maybe differently, but, but not, I mean, I'm not suggesting necessarily that Dr. Ramirez or that you suggest fundamental changes to the assignments, but how could, what could Dr. Ramirez do to prevent these potential problems from occurring? So what kinds of problems could students with ASD encounter with the assignment? And how could Dr. Ramirez structure it to prevent these problems? So I want you to, do, I want you to get together with someone next to you. Doesn't have to be someone you know. It could be someone different. So you want to think and kind of, well, get together and discuss ideas. And you can maybe jot a couple notes, and then we'll share as a group. And I'll, yep, sure.
Raise your hand if your group's finished. Okay. Let's take a couple more minutes. Okay. I was thinking, well, I was thinking, uh, actually, this would be a pretty good break point. So, yeah, sure. We'll just regroup and then we'll. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, take one more minute. So I, I hope you had some good discussion. It sounds like you did. What, what kinds of problems could a student with ASD encounter with this assignment, given the, what we discussed? Uh huh. Lack of structure. Okay, lack of structure. So could you be a little bit more specific about how this particular assignment Lacks structure. Um, knowing when to discuss on blackboards, I guess. Okay, so, so no, so, and I guess we're assuming that. Well, we're only going on the information that that I've given you here, but so maybe some. It, it could the description of the assignment or the objectives of the assignment could be more specific about when students are supposed to have discussions, and also maybe about what they're supposed to say during those discussions. Uh-huh. Like, I mean, if you could structure it kind of tightly with uh, how many discussion portions are they supposed to have, and what portions are they supposed to Okay. Good. Okay, good, good, yes, yes. So this is kind of skipping ahead to sort of the second part. How could this be structured differently? There's some very good um, suggestions, particularly about what are supposed to be the different roles of members of the group, and we're going to come back to that point later. What else about this might make it a little bit tougher for the student to be successful? Uh huh. Right. Right, right. And so according, and, and, and that's something that students with ASD might struggle with a little bit. So the more explicit we can make the expectations in terms of when communication is supposed to occur, how much, how much communication is supposed to happen, the content of the communication, the different roles of the group members, this will, this will help. Other th thoughts about what, how this might be troubling? Right, good, good. Or student with ASD, for a variety of reasons, like they might not be um, <clears throat> a part of the social networks that are, currently exist that might uh, enable them to be drawn into a group or asked to be in a group. They might not know where to put themselves. So, yes, that's another excellent point. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. So we could probably, yeah, exactly. Because they have difficulty understanding others' perspectives and points of view, the whole nature of the assignment might be a problem because they're going to struggle with understanding with, well, what isn't a, I mean, how do you understand what somebody else is thinking? So we probably anticipate that there are going to be some problems there to begin with. And so what, how could, let's, just, let's assume that this is, you know, the student's in the course, and the student's got to learn this stuff. So how could you 
structure the assignment or provide instructions, directions, so they're more likely to pick up on, on, on that or to be successful with that portion of it. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So provide some very specific guiding questions or prompts at certain, you know, certain points in the movie, what to look for. Maybe provide some examples and non-examples of what um, this particular interpersonal communication behavior looks like and then doesn't look like. So that, that, those things would all be quite helpful. Wow, so these are some really, really great ideas you have, and it was really great. You kind of picked up on some, some things that might be problematic and some good solutions. So we're going to take a break right now for about five minutes. There's some waters and sodas and stuff down here. Please help yourselves. It's, if that clock is accurate, which I think it is, it's about 328. So we'll come back at about 3.34, 3.35. Continue. <clears throat> <laughs> well, see, I'm, see, I, I suspect that you're, you're very, given the suggestions that you made about that vineyard.
So, <laughs> gotten. Uh huh. Sure. Mm -hmm. From family members and whatnot. Uh huh. We have had to, it tends to be that any student who's marching off the side of the <clears throat> tends to think they're going to major in either math or chemistry or science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They run through our department like water. And we yep. had one that was, I have no idea what the entire <laughs> spectrum was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We currently have one who is not a math major, she's a math major. <coughs> she does not <coughs> sell her ass on the human and math genre. Right, right. And she was in my ninth two and a half hour long class. It was determined by herself at OSD that maybe she shouldn't take a ninth class. Partly because I was saying, I have no support. I'm here until 8.30 at night by myself with 30 other students. Right, and right. She's wandering around lost. She gets lost between the ladies' room. And, you know, she, yeah. You know, and this was beyond what I felt was safe. There were students who she's now been transferred into my colleagues' colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> well, a student like that is going to really, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about some sort of, Sure. Now with a partner, now I realize you got a bunch of other people here. Right, yeah, sure. But we really have some seriously, you know, issues. No, I understand, yeah. And, and I'll, you need help with a student like that. We do. We do. And there are ways to support that. Dirt. Right. Sure. Sure. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. And the other but this. this computer was supposed to be my academic advisee. Oh, the young lady we're talking about used to break into singing the theme from Two and a Half Men. Right. Sometimes. Right. <laughs> Here, right, know? right. So, just so you know. All right, thanks. I appreciate you sharing that. Right. Right. Well, that's good to have that resource there for sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we'll go ahead and get uh, get started. Yeah, sure, I'll cut, yeah, yeah. As we think about how best to support and enable students with ASD to be successful, there's some important uh, assumptions that guide our thinking. Prevention. So it's better to prevent problems than to react to them. And as we talk about primary prevention and universal design strategies to help all students, including those with disabilities and autism, to be successful, we're, we're, 
we're, we're focusing on prevention. We're recognizing that if we structure our course and, and teach in a certain way from the outset, we're going to have fewer problems. Universal design, these are strategies that benefit all students, including those with ASD. As, as instructors, professors, we've, we have a lot to do. The, there, was, um, there was a survey that came out like two months ago or three months ago, and it, was, um, it's, it said that, that being a college professor was, was, was like the number one least stressful job. Did anybody hear about this? Yeah, right. And then you were, and then you were sort of like, "What plan? You know, what planet are, are you on?" Like, it's we have a lot. It's we have a lot on our on our plates. So we want to be as efficient as possible. So if we're going to do something differently, if we're going to teach in a particular way, we want it to be something that's going to be beneficial to all students, and it's going to help our teaching generally, and not just something that's going to be focused on. Um, you know, one particular student, although there may be some times where we have to do focus our attention and support a particular student. Um, good instructors versus poor instructors. This is just a sort of general point I, I want to make that <clears throat> folks who are, t professors who are highly systematic and they use good universal design and primary prevention strategies, and they're just good instructors in, in general, they make their expectations clear. They provide frequent feedback. They're, they're going to in, encounter relatively fewer problems than instructors who struggle a little bit more to make expectations clear. They're a little bit more disorganized. They don't get the feedback to students right away. Um, so these issues are not just issues of you know, relevant to students with ASD and students with disability. They're, they're broader issues about teaching and instructional effectiveness. So has anybody ever seen this triangle before? This is no, okay, good. So this is new. So this is the <clears throat> this triangle shows kind of a logic of prevention or three-tiered logic of prevention in, in positive behavior support. If we look at the green part of the triangle, well, if we think of the triangle as representing all students, our entire student population here at Edinburgh or any university. <clears throat> The area in the green would be most students, including many students with ASD. So these are going to be strategies that we'll use to accommodate and support all students. And these would be our universal design strategies that I'm going to talk about. In the yellow area of the triangle, we have students who need a more intensive level of support. These are not the students who, and, and um, you, I'm, I'm sorry, what's your name? I'm Emily Sprague, Dr. Sprague. Dr. Sprague was sharing with me some you know, examples of students with ASD who were sort of like what, in what sounded like crisis mode in, in her class. They're probably not quite in the yellow part of the triangle, but these are students who are maybe are at risk for failure, who need a more intensive level of support, they need more targeted interventions, they need specific disability-based accommodations. They probably are receiving accommodations through the Office of Students with Disabilities. They'll need some targeted advisement strategies. They're sort of in the yellow part of the triangle, and we would focus our secondary prevention or those secondary prevention efforts on them. And then finally, at the very tip of the triangle, we have the sort of heavy hitter students, the students who are failing, the students who are, are, are on the verge of failing out of college, who need crisis management and individualized troubleshooting strategies. So we're going to frame our strategies for supporting students with ASD within this three-tiered logic or this three-tiered heuristic. I didn't make this up. This, is a, this triangle is part of the logic in something called school-wide positive behavior support that's in about 20,000 schools. By schools, I mean like K through 12 schools in the United States, but this is an extension of this prevention logic to students with ASD in higher education. <clears throat> so at the first level, primary intervention, universal design, we have strategies that we can use with all students in our courses. <clears throat> the first is a clear, accessible syllabus. 
Probably somewhere on your university website, it says that this stuff has to be in your syllabus. And, and those of you who are familiar with your colleges or schools or departments, policies may know where this information is. But there should be on your syllabus a statement about the university's disability accommodations policy. A statement encouraging students to talk with the instructor about any special needs on the basis of a disability. So raise your hand if you're a teacher and you know this stuff is on your syllabus. Okay, so, for, so it's, it's probably, and is it supposed to be on your syllabus according to some policy? Okay, it's not. Well, because where I am, they make this stuff, they make you put it on your syllabus, which is right. Precisely stated learning objectives. What are going to be the learning objectives for this course? And I'll have some, show you some examples in a, in a little bit. What are the specific objectives or outcomes that we expect from, from our students? And I don't think that's, a, that's not an unreasonable thing to put on the syllabus. But it makes it clear for the students what they're supposed to learn, what they're supposed to be getting out of this course. A schedule of events, including discussion topics, exam dates, assignments, and readings to be completed for each day. Again, this might seem sort of like pretty obvious or axiomatic stuff, but if you look across syllabi, you might not see it on everybody's syllabus. But again, this is all about, remember, students with ASD thrive with structure and predictability. This is all about making things predictability to the extent, predictable to the extent that they can be. And it, 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 these strategies that, I'm gonna, um, that we're going to discuss today are things that I use in my own teaching. And I don't teach that many students with ASD in, in my classes, or at least that I, that I know of. But they're things that are beneficial for everybody, for all students, and they help me be a better instructor. How the instructor will calculate grades and an expla explanation of what's required to receive a grade. Again, again, pretty obvious, but I'll show you some specific examples of how I do this in my courses. How the instructor will deal with tardiness, absences, late assignments, tests and academic makeups, and academic misconduct. If you've ever been in a grade appeal situation or if you've ever been involved in a grade appeal, um, I've, never had a, I've never had a formal grade appeal, but I've served on a committee that handles grade appeals. To the, to the extent that this stuff I'm recommending is clearly spelled out in your syllabus, the more protection you will have as an instructor if you give a student a failing grade. Um, over the years, I've worked out every you know, contingency for, and I have contingencies for attendance in my class. I actually have a contingency for my classes that meet once a week. If you don't show up twice and you don't tell me about it, you're going to fail. How many students have I failed over the years because they don't meet that contingency? Not many, a couple. Why? Because I'm very clear. I'm very clear about my expectations. I communicate my expectations. And frankly, it's a very, very aversive contingency. And Students show up to my class. Now, I'm, you might think, like, you know, it's a pretty, pretty punitive thing. But something like that is only punitive if a lot of students run into, the, run into the consequence and end up failing out of the course. It's not actually particularly punitive if students avoid it because, they're, because they, they don't want the bad grade. So students come to class. <clears throat> it's also really important to make an announcement at the beginning of the semester encouraging students to speak privately with you, with the instructor, about any accommodations they may need. Very important. Because oftentimes we'll have that statement in the syllabus, but if, if we tell students, if you, have, if you have a disability, you don't have to disclose your disability to me, but if you have a disability and you want to talk about any kind of accommodations that, that you may need, please come see me and come talk to me about it. So I know at my uni the universities where I've worked, when students go to the disability services office and, they, and they're entitled to an accommodation, they get a paper, right? How many of you have ever, like, you've, you've showed up for the first day to teach your class and a student walks up to you and then they, and they sort of walk away, right? Raise your hand if you've had that, right? Well, that is, that's not, it's not your fault that, they're, that that's all they're doing, right? What, what they should be doing is self-advocating and saying, hi, I'm Suzanne. 
Um, I, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about my, my learning needs. Um, I want to talk with you a little bit about, about being in this course. I haven't had you as a professor before. Could we schedule an appointment during your office hours? And then during office hours, hi, I just wanted to let you know I have a learning disability or have, or have autism spectrum disorder. Sometimes I have difficulty if there are unexpected um, assignments. And I was looking at your syllabus and I was noting that it says you have quizzes here, but it doesn't say when, they're in the, in the, when they are in the course schedule. It would be wonderful if they did that. And I think asking them if they have those needs to come and see you is a great thing, but they may not necessarily do that. Um, but that is more of an issue that the, the advisors in the, in the room, I think that's more of an issue for the advisors in the room to help students be better self-advocates. <clears throat> but again, these are universal strategies, so we're just making that announcement. Having study objectives for each chapter of course material. And I also just wanted to make a comment that my PowerPoint, along with a set of guided notes, is going to be up on the provost's website. So you'll be able to get all this, the, the, the PowerPoint and all this material after the presentation. Um, there will be a video of me, is that right, Julia, you think? The provost left the room, so. Um, <laughs> There should also be a video of me available um, too, but we'll, we'll ask him about that when he, he's going to be back. We'll, we'll ask him. There's going to be a video. Thanks. So these are some uh, st study objectives. And provide study guides for each unit. So I'll give you an example of a study guide that I provide. I'll say this about guided notes and study guides. So I'm prepping a new course right now. And so I'm having to generate new study guides and new guided notes for every session. Then it's kind of a pain. And like I got an email from a student. I forgot to put up my study guides like the last time one of my classes met and I got an email from a student like saying like, well, I forgot to put them up and I, and I got to that class and the students were like, what, where, where's a study guide? Like they were really, they were missing them greatly. They're a pain on the front end, but once you've, once you've written them, you have them, they're there, and they don't go away. So, I mean, assuming that you can teach the course at least a few more times without having to re-prep it, it's a resource that you have. And basically, this is a class on teaching students with ASD, ironically. So I've got a section here. Frankly, my study, study guides don't take that long for, to make, for me to make anyway. Um, this might take me, after I've done my PowerPoint for the lecture, this might take me 15 minutes to make. So I've got a list of my key terms, and then I've got learning objectives in the form of questions. Some instructors I, I've known over the years have required, required students to complete study guides, or they've given them points for them. I don't do that. I make, I make it an optional resource, because just like with guided notes, I find that there are students who do them and find them really beneficial, and there are other students who don't need them particularly, but I avail this resource of them. And then when a student is struggling in a course, or a student is having difficulty with, a, with quizzes or something, I say, are you reviewing the study guides before you begin your reading? Are you, um, are you looking for the key terms? Are you completing them as you're reading? And in many cases, they're not. So, for, for those students, these study guides are, are very beneficial. So it's just the ba basic key terms from the chapter along with um, learning objectives that are stated in the form of questions that they can answer, and these are things that we're going to go over in class. <clears throat> and I mentioned earlier that we're using Blackboard, so everything, and I assume that, what is it called, your system called again? D D12? D2L, desire to learn, D2L. Thank you. I assume that you have something like this, and so I, everything's posted before class so students can go and get them and print them out. I make them Microsoft Word documents. I make my guided, guided notes Microsoft Word documents, and I'm kind of on the fence about this one because you may have a policy in, in, your, in your course where students can't bring laptops, but some students like to bring laptops and they like to do their guided notes on their laptops. If, as opposed to printing them out and bringing them to class. I'll show you the guided notes in a minute. 
Um, so I'm sort of on the fence about that because uh, uh, honestly, raise your hand if you have a policy where you, students can't have laptops in your class, can't use them. Oh, okay. I know some, okay. Yeah, I know some departments do. Some, and some, yeah, I mean, some, I don't have that policy, but I found that if you let students use laptops, even if they're doing guided notes, I think they're doing other things at the same time, like they're doing their emails or they're on Facebook or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a two-sided coin. <clears throat> Provide grading rubrics with clear performance standards, so how points will be assigned for each assignment. And I was telling Dr. Hannon over, over the break that, you know, I, I like to give students very, well, we were both sharing that we like to give students very clear um, uh, explanations for assignments. So this is just an example. So this is a literature review assignment, and I've made what's it's basically a task analysis. And this is, so the assignment is worth 100 points, and this is how I'm assigning points for each component of the assignment. And this is easy for me when I'm grading because I have this sheet in front of me, and when students hand in the assignment, they're expected to print it out and give it to me. And then as I'm grading it, I'm just I'm I'm reading for each of these criteria. And over the years I found that I have to sort of tweak it. And over the years I've found generally I tend to give more points just for writing, quality of writing, than I do for in, in other areas. Test frequently and evaluate performance frequently. <clears throat> Midterms and finals have a tendency to create kind of doomsday scenarios, if you know what I mean. So if 50% or 75% of the student's grade is based upon two tests, your midterm and your final, um, it's, it's kind of make or break for, for the students. And <clears throat> there's something that we know from a lot of really basic science, basic behavior analysis literature about how people respond when the reinforcer is going to come at a fixed point in time. Students kind of, or, or, or human organisms and non-human organisms kind of engage in a scalloped pattern of responding where at the beginning of, if there's a midterm, at the beginning of the semester, and also think back to your own schooling, how much do you study at the beginning of the semester if there's going to be a midterm? And I know you're, a lot of you are professors and you were great students, but let's be honest here, right? When I was an undergraduate, yeah, not much. When I was an undergraduate, I took this, like, brain anatomy course, and, like, I remember I used to get, I, I, I would cram at the last minute. I got, if the test was going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning, I would get up at, like, 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'd be reading to prepare for that test. Well, our students do the same thing. So, infrequent tests, students will study very little towards the beginning of the semester, and they'll begin to cram and cram and cram and cram and cram. And, cram. and there's, for anyone who's a, any psychologist here, there's sort of like this basic psych 101 concept that distributed practice or spaced practice is better than practicing all at once, right? And so if students only study a day or two before they actually get the exam, they're not as likely to do as well on the exam, and they're probably not going to learn as much. So giving testing frequently or evaluating performance frequently has a couple of advantages. One, it discourages procrastination because students are having to study all along. So I give quizzes in every class. It's not a 20-question quiz. It's a 10-question quiz. It's, um, it, it could be cumulative or it could, it could not be cumulative. And depending on the subject, I often give non-cumulative quizzes, but not always. And it forces students to read and stay up with the material in a way that's not aversive. And students might kind of, it's often, I have, sometimes I have a really big struggle with students in my education courses because it's like they're not used to taking tests because I seem to be one of the only education professors who likes to give quizzes and tests. But once they get used to them, they do, they do, they do well on them. 
and it's an effective way to, to teach and, and to ensure that they're learning. So this would just be an example of a, of a quiz, again, from that autism course. So a mix of multiple choice and true-false questions. Providing frequent feedback. So you don't only have to um, give frequent feedback and assess performance frequently in terms of quizzes. There are other things that you can do. So one strategy I have, it's, it's um, called an interteach. So students are given, um, I might show them a video that demonstrates a concept like inclusion. And I give them a set of questions that they would answer together. And collectively, as a group, they may hand in a paper with an writing answers to those questions. Or I, might ask, or I might require that they write their answers individually and hand in, a, in each of them hand in a paper individually. And I do that every single class. So it's a way for me to assess their performance and how they're doing and how they're learning. <clears throat> think writes and think pair shares. Um, we did a think pair share a little bit earlier. <clears throat> These are examples of active student response strategies. <clears throat> Getting students to do things as they're, um, and, and explicitly arranging opportunities for students to respond and participate. It's beneficial for all students because the more students are actively doing, the better. But it's also beneficial for students with ASD because it's giving them structure and something to do. So I'm going to give you an example of <clears throat> guided notes. <clears throat> Does anybody use guided notes? You do? OK. <clears throat> so guided notes, it's a record of the lecture from, that's taken directly from a PowerPoint presentation. But if you look, there's something that's a little bit different about it. It's not just a straight up PowerPoint. What do you see that's different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say it's a closed, a closed activity. But basically, there are spaces missing for students to write in. It takes a little time to do these initially. But once you have your set, you have your set. We find that students, not just students with ASD, but students with learning disabilities, and many college students generally are not particularly good note takers. So this enables students to have an accurate record of what was taught during the lecture. And it also enables them to actively respond. And they're not having to write so many notes that they're not paying attention to you. They're still paying attention to you. But they're also having to participate. And again, there'll be an example of guided notes up on the website. And I also, I'm not sure if I have them here, but I also have like any think rights or any structured learning activities, I can plug them directly into my guided notes. <clears throat> response cards. We'll do a response card activity in a little bit, but basically response cards are I, I, I wanted to bring more of them, but they're really heavy. So, and I was like, I had a carry-on bag on the on the airplane, so I was kind of concerned about hauling them. Um, but basically, this is. Does anybody know what what this is? What these are? Hmm. It's a, something you'd buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. It's called bathroom board or shower board, and if you, they'll cut it for you if you tell them that you're an educator. They'll they'll cut it into pieces for you. Never buy these things. It's a whiteboard, but never buy these things at, at, at an office supply store, teacher supply store, because they're really expensive. These will cost you five or eight bucks for one of these things there. This, co this cost me, I have maybe 80 of these things, and I think it cost me $15 for the whole set. Right? You ask students questions. You have a series of questions. We'll, we'll do this later. Students write their answers on the whiteboards, and they raise them up. Do you have anything like a personal response system here or clickers here? Do you use that system here? This is, pretty, this is a low-tech version of that. I've used personal response system. It's like a system where students have clickers and they're all radio controlled. The advantage of the personal response system is that it gives you data that can kind of, that, and you can share feedback with how the students did on the question, like within, like up on, a, on, on the computer screen. 
there are a lot of disadvantages to those systems too. I'm not a huge advocate of those systems because like it's technology, it breaks down, students, the batteries don't work, the radio signals don't work, it's another thing to kind of have to set up. These are cheap. They're cheap, they're easy to use. All you need is these boards, some dry erase markers and some, um, and some tissue or some, frankly, toilet paper. And it, they, they work really well. It's another way to facilitate active student responses. And the way that I use them is at the end of the, at the, end of the class period as a review of what we've just learned or often at the beginning of the class period as a review for what we learned during the previous class. People love them. Students love them. I've never had a complaint about response cards over the years from any, from any student. Um, they've complained about other things, but not that. iPad um, has a program called, called Doodle Draw. Do you know this? If you have an iPad, I believe it's free. It's an app. And it's basically a response card app. It's, like a, it's just a white, blank, white screen. And you can draw on it with your hand. And it accomplishes the same thing. So you don't even have to have response cards. We'll come back to response cards later. All right. Considerations for group assignments and activities. <clears throat> we, we had the earlier example of the group activity was maybe not structured in a way that would maximize success. If you're going to give group activities, you should delineate cr clear roles for each member of the group. Now, I'm not saying that you would, I'm not saying that you have to say you're the note taker. You're the organizer. You're the, you're the spokesperson. You can let students figure that stuff out. But you, I'm recommending that you have them identify who, which person is going to be in each of those roles. If we think about students with ASD, and we think about these different roles, organizer, note taker, recorder, spokesperson, researcher, is the person, maybe the person wants to be the spokesperson, but, but perhaps not. But this at least gives a structure to the group so that each person will fulfill some role. Provide clear rules for how members should work together. So for example, be respectful of other, others' points of view. <clears throat> Do your share of the work. <clears throat> Provide clear objectives. So differentiate grades for individual versus group performance. And we heard some examples of how to structure um, expectations for a group assignment earlier. <clears throat> okay. So here's a think right activity that I want you to do on your own. Consider a course you are teaching or even one if you're not teaching one you've taken. What aspects of universal design that we discussed do you incorporate into the class? How could the, how could the course be changed to capitalize on universal design strategies? So just to review, <clears throat> our universal design strategies were a clear accessible syllabus, study objectives and study guides, grading rubrics, testing frequently or evaluating performance frequently, frequent feedback, active student response strategies, and structure for group activities. So consider a course you're teaching or one you've taken and what aspects of universal design you incorporated into the class, or maybe how you could have changed the design of the course to encourage universal design. Just think and, and write your answers, and then we'll share. And if you want to, if you want to talk with your neighbor, that's, that's fine. Or think of strategies together, that's fine.
Raise your hand if you're finished. A few people, okay, I'll take another minute. Okay, so reflecting on a course you've taught or one you've taken, what aspects of universal design, either examples that I've shared or, or other ones, were in the course or are in the course? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, good, good. And do you find that, that that's been helpful for you? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, good. So, so having a very clear syllabus with very clear expectations of students. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Good, good, yes. Yes, I was in a, I was a participating in like a week-long workshop one time that involved a lot of group work, and the facilitator had us in those roles that I gave you examples of, and it was very beneficial, I thought. Um, well, or rather, I should say, the instructor had a self-assign into those roles, and it, it was very helpful. And I've, we found that people sort of felt, you know, people, some people like to write notes, some people like to talk. Some people like to just kind of be more the organizer of things. So, good. <clears throat> right, yes. So that would be a good, good, yes, thank you. That would be a really good instruction to give somebody to consider, you know, you know consider which, which one you would be, you would excel at. Other strategies that you've used or would consider using? Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that. That's a really good point. Quizzes also encourage attendance. Um, I used to have, well, I guess. My, my makeup policy has basically been if someone has to miss class for a good reason, then I'll let them make it up, like, uh, like let's say, right before the next class when I'm going to go over it. And that seems to work pretty well. I don't get, in a, I don't get too many students who want to make up a quiz. I don't get very many students who miss a, qu miss a quiz and just don't tell me about it. So that's a pretty good good policy. But again, yeah, that really encourages people to come to class, to keep up with the reading and study along. Good. How about one more? One more? Anybody? Thank you. I, I did my intermediate algebra class. Um, let's say developmental math class. Uh -huh. Okay, okay.
between each one individually, their shell surface are going to get smaller at the ends and each one as well. Okay, good. Right. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Excellent. Well, thank, thanks for sharing that. Okay. So moving into secondary interventions um, with disability accommodations and targeted advisement. So these would be for students who would not benefit or it would not be sufficient for us to use the universal design strategies alone. These are probably students with, with disabilities or maybe these are students who come to the, the university maybe lacking some of the necessary self-advocacy and problem solving and study skills that they might need. So these are more targeted strategies. So just a couple, um, or these might be students who have a documented disability who get accommodations through the Office of Students with Disabilities. So just some important comments about accommodations. So Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disability Act Mandate that post-secondary institutions provide reasonable accommodation to students with disabilities. Now, is there a hard and fast definition of what reasonable means? No, it's just it's, it's, it's a word we have to kind of take it at face value. Um, students have to document that they have a disability in order to receive a reasonable accommodation. Once a student has documented that they have a disability, they've gone to the, to, to the Office of Students with Disabilities, then the Office of Students with Disabilities will <clears throat> recommend that the student receive specific accommodations and you as the instructor will be required to provide the student or allow the student to have those accommodations. So it's important to understand that if a student has gone to Office for Students with Disabilities and shown that they have an autism spectrum disorder or a learning disability or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And that office, as, as representing the university, has said this student is entitled to extra time to take tests or to take tests in a quiet area. Um, as the instructor, you have to provide that particular accommodation. There's no choice at that point. Um, and those would be a couple of examples of specific accommodations. It's also important to distinguish between the concept of an accommodation and modification. So there are course accommodations and there are course modifications. And I think oftentimes instructors will confuse the two. They think they're giving a modification when really it's just an accommodation. An accommodation is basically something that levels the playing field for the student, right? So if we give the student, if we allow the student to take a test in a distraction-free environment, let's say it's at the Office for Students with Disabilities in a, in, a, um, in a quiet room or something like that, are we making the test easier for them? No. Are we changing what they're requiring them to learn and, and know and demonstrate to us? No. We're just, on, be, because maybe they're, they have ADHD and they're easily distractible, or because they have an autism spectrum disorder and, and noises are very distracting for them, we're just leveling the playing field. We're changing the environment a little bit so that they can show us their true potential and what they really know. That's an accommodation. A modification is something that's different. A modification is a lowering of the learning standard. A modification is saying that, oh, you only have to do five problems instead of ten. Or, well, you don't really need to know that developmental, that particular developmental math concept 
don't worry about it. We're not asking them to do that. We're not asking for that. We're not modifying what we're expecting them to know. We're simply saying we're leveling the playing field. We're saying here are some things that are going to help you show us what you really know. And that's what we're, we're really looking to provide. We don't, I, I don't know of any situation where instructors would be expected to, to provide a modification. Um, I, just, I just don't. And that's not what we're asking you to do. Some typical accommodations for students with ASD, and this is not just for students with ASD, it could be for other students as well. Additional time on examinations. Alternative testing or exam locations. Tutoring. A mentor from the Office of Students with Disabilities. <clears throat> and I think that there may be a program here that's in place like that where a mentor or a peer advisor is provided. So that would be a, um, an, an example. Uh, a private room in the, the residence halls or particular roommates who might be better suited to, to helping that student get along in um, residence life. Why, what would you think would be the rationale for providing a private room for a student with ASD? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe the student needs a certain amount of quiet time during the day, but they can just not, where it's just they have to be there alone in the room, but they cannot negotiate that with another roommate. So it's important to understand with something like a residence hall accommodation, it's not like, you know, the student's getting special treatment or a private room, though we want to make sure that we're not giving the student a private room for that reason. We want to make sure that the student has a disability and there are certain characteristics and issues that accompany that disability that make this something that the student needs in order to be able to um, be successful in, in the residence hall. And there probably are situations where you provide that accommodation and probably, and probably some situations where you haven't provided that accommodation. Is, am I correct about that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and also possibly a reduced course load um, for the student, you know, maybe at least at the beginning of their college experience until they get to a point where they can demonstrate that they can handle a full course load. <clears throat> These are some strategies for advisors to use. Um, taking notes of student meeting, meetings and emailing summaries to students, including goals and specific steps to resolve issues. And advisors, you may already have this kind of built into your advising system, but oftentimes students, may, students with ASD may kind of forget or they may focus on one particular point and sort of forget everything else. So it's good to summarize with notes and send those to the student. Um, Generate interim progress reports before the end of the semester or have, ask students to keep their track of their grades and then have a meeting at midpoint in the semester with you so that there's no surprise B or no, I shouldn't say surprise B, I don't know what that would be. There's no surprise Ds or Fs. This is an example of a form that I've used to help students keep track of their grades during the semester. I sometimes actually provide these in, in courses. <clears throat> Helping students select courses. So I'm curious with for advisors, what kinds of, if you've been advising students with ASD, what kinds of directions might you steer them in with regard to courses? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes. Okay. 
Can, okay, so, to, so trying to schedule the classes consistently, basically five days a week. It was a stu so the student was like just, for, he was having difficulty managing the schedule and forgetting? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, yeah, so for some students it might be about scheduling that type of consistency. Um, students might struggle with courses that require abstract thinking um, or courses that don't have a lot of structure. Um, you might also be able to give advice about particular instructors or professors who have more structured teaching styles as opposed to others. And do you give that sort of advice to, to students? Are you allowed to? <laughs> so she's shaking her head, but I, I, don't know if you're, I don't know if you're allowed to talk. Maybe you're not allowed to admit that in front of the provost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Well, it's good, good. Um, inquire about student interests and strengths and attempt to schedule courses in these areas. So do students have to take like at Temple, we call them general education courses. Right? So you could take a look at the content of the general education courses and probably match them more closely to some students' interests. Um, so for example, I'm thinking like, this is like a, just a really obvious you know, thing, but like, if a student is like really into movies and they're like, their obsession is with movies, well then you could schedule a course where they're, it's a course where it's like a, a, a film criticism course, right? But they may not otherwise know to put themselves or register for that course without, you know, somebody kind of doing a little inventory of their likes and dislikes and strengths and things that they succeeded with in high school and then pointing them in that particular direction. <clears throat> Students may have difficulty with physical education courses, and you mentioned that this wasn't a requirement anymore, but they might have difficulties with, students with ASD might have difficulties with certain sounds. They might be physically clumsy. And so you should encourage them to, um, if they had to take a PE course, maybe encourage non-competitive courses or non-team courses, um, things where they can do activities, physical activities alone, maybe running or power walking or something like that. You could encourage students to schedule downtime between courses. And also, you might suggest problems to different sensory issues. Like so for example, if a student has difficulty with being disrupted by sounds and noises during tests, well they could put earplugs in. And I can't really think of a situation where a professor would have a problem with the student put earplugs in his, her ears during a test. But that would just be one kind of self-management type strategy. It's also very important to encourage students to meet with instructors at the beginning of the semester to discuss course expectations, the students' challenges, and suggestions for success. And talk about safe spaces or safe places when things aren't going well. So when a student is, is feeling like he or she is in crisis or having a problem, what's the plan? And um, we, uh, we were talking earlier about an example of, um, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I forget your name, Emily. Yeah, we were talking about a, a couple of examples of students being in, in crisis and kind of freaking out in class and the instructor sort of being like not knowing what to do. Well, that student, may, you know, maybe all that student needed was a plan for what to do when she lost her earring or for when she was just feeling really agitated. And... Um, and sometimes that's enough. <clears throat> and also encourage students to rely on available support networks. And this would mean, you know, anybody who's around locally, whether that would be family members or friends that the student can talk to when the student is in crisis, encourage students to seek, seek out any available of those locally available support networks, or even maybe if it's somebody to call on the phone. I wanted to draw your attention to a resource. <clears throat> so several years ago, 
I worked on a project where we developed a series, well, we developed a video that teaches students how to talk with their professors and to request accommodations and how to self-advocate. So I want to show you this little um, sample of the video. And if you go to Temple's Disability Resources and Services office, in fact, we'll just go to the home page. You just, right. This is actually the home page of, of our Dis Disability Resources and Services office, and you'll see there's a video here, and you can browse all videos. It, it's actually, it's all, all the videos are with real students with disabilities and real professors talking about how students can request accommodations. but I wanted to show you this video in particular. Because it really nicely demonstrates how a student can talk with her professor. If you have a documented disability and receive support through DRS, you may be eligible to a reasonable accommodation. Request the accommodation using a statement. For example, say, a note taker has helped me in the past. Is that okay? Rather than saying, can I use a note taker? Make the instructor aware of accommodations used in other courses. State available resources from DRS or say, I have a letter from DRS. And finally, describe what you will do to help arrange for the accommodation and ask for agreement. Uh, I like to work out with my professors on um, some of the accommodations that I have uh, to make me be better poised to succeed in this class. Okay. Uh, past accommodations that I've used uh, with the test taking, I've used the DRS here at Temple University. If you send the test over prior to class, I can complete it there um, in a secluded area with no distractions. I have um, another option that you might want to consider. Could I uh, offer having you start the exam in the office next door? and then uh, finishing up the exam in the classroom so that you're with the other students, would that work for you? That would actually work a lot better for me because I like to stay with my peers when I take tests, so thank you for that option. Yeah, that would work. Um, and then, of course, the note taker. This is where I actually need your help. Okay, so what can I do to help you with that? Well, I need um, help finding a note taker, and this would just be a buddy that I could compare notes with to make sure that I got all the essential points of your lecture. Okay, so by asking class uh, for volunteers, uh, whatever feels most comfortable comfortable for you. If you want to ask in class um, for volunteers, or if you want to take a week or two and you find a student that you think would be a good fit for me and you want to pair okay, with that makes sense. sense. Yeah, let's let's go with that option. I'll uh, look for somebody that uh, is taking notes and seems to be attending in class. Great. Thanks again. If a student has a documented disability, they will typically uh, make arrangements with the Department of Disability Resources and Services for that office to sort of serve as a liaison between the student and the professor. I work with them to decide what to do. They say email the professor, let them know if they had any problems, and then you could contact the DRS staff. So I email the professor and explain that I'm deaf. I will be having two interpreters. And they email me back, so that's fine. It is important to state that this is the accommodations that you need rather than ask for them. Because if you ask for them, it's, it always seems like you're asking for special privileges or special treatment. If you say, oh, well, is it okay if I have extra test time? One of the things that's very helpful when the student is actually requesting the accommodation is if they mention to the professor what accommodations have worked in the past. He or she can say, well, I've had a note taker in the past, and it's helped in this way. And that way, the professor can understand how the current accommodations or future accommodations can actually help the student. So what it is that, particularly in the longer classes, like the three-hour lectures, I sometimes lose focus a little bit, so I, go, I leave for a few minutes and come back in just so I can clear my head and pay attention to the lecture you know, better when I come back in. Okay. Um, I have a stress ball that I squeeze in class sometimes. <coughs> I'm anxious. That's a good idea, the stress ball. And I won't be offended if you leave my class for a little for a few minutes. Uh, okay. <laughs> and um, I feel like the main thing is that I've arranged with the Department of Disability Resources and Services that I have extended test time and I take my exams at their office. 
Um, just because without the, uh, the time limit on exams, it's a lot less anxiety for me in taking my test. Okay. So I think those accommodations probably help a lot with this, with this class here. Do these accommodations seem reasonable to you? Yeah. Kind of yeah, they seem reasonable to me. I mean, you know, you, it looks like you've gone through your DRS already, so I'm sure, you know, faith, you know, being a reasonable is reasonable for me. Accommodation simply allows you to gain access to that to that room, to that environment, to, to be in the classroom and succeeding at the rate of everybody else around you. I try to provide a lot of ways that students can access notes or access um, information or ask questions without any kind of uh, guilt or um, feeling of inferiority. Chances are if, if a professor is accommodating students with disabilities who are fully um, warranted in receiving these, they're probably going to be making learning opportunities available to a greater degree. Okay. So, again, there are a seri series of video resources on students self-advocating and requesting accommodations. If you go to Temple's um, Disability Resources and Services website, you can check out the rest of the videos. Um, the, the, the example of the woman who's sort, sort of towards the end of the video saying, oh, I might, need to, I might need to step out of class sometimes just to kind of, you know, um, just take a, take a break. It makes all the difference if a student is able to talk with an instructor about that particular accommodation. If the, stu if the student never made that apparent and the student just walked out of the classroom, you know, the instructor might think like, you know, what's this person doing? You know, she just gets up every once in a while, she's out there in the hallway, she's texting, she's on Facebook or whatever. But communicating that makes all the difference, so I would encourage students to do that. I had a student um, one, who, one time who was, um, she had attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and at the beginning of the semester she told me, I have to get up out of my seat and walk around and, 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 and move around. And I said, oh, you know, I, I, have AD, I have ADHD, I just wanted to let you know this is something that I need to do, is it okay? And I said, yeah, I guess. And sure enough, when I would get a little bit into the lecture. She would get up out of her seat and she would kind of walk around and move around and she would be in the corner of the room kind of and then she would move around a little bit more. And I, honestly, I thought it was a little bit weird, but first, she aced it. She got 100% and she was one of the best students in my, in my course. And so again, it's like if you don't, if she hadn't told me that, I would have thought there's probably, I, I might have had a problem with it, but because she disclosed her disability and talked with me about that, it was, it was better. Now, I do want to mention that a student is not obligated to disclose the nature of his or her disability, even if she's receiving or he, she, he's receiving an accommodation. So students are not obligated to say, I have a learning disability or I, I have ADHD. Um, and you can't ask a student if they have a disability. You can't do that because they're protected under the ADA and, and Section 504. Mm-hmm. That's a really great question. I, I didn't because it was the student was part of a cohort of students who were going through a program and they were all taking the same courses together and the other students knew that she had um, some issue. I think probably most of them knew she had ADHD so they were sort of used to it. And, and she did it in a very non-disruptive way, so I didn't feel there was a need to address it. Um, but, in, it, it, you know, I think it's something you really have to troubleshoot and problem solve through if it's going to be something that's distracting. I had another student with ADHD who, oh gosh, she wanted to, she wanted to do something that was very distracting to, to other students in the, in the class. <sighs> I, I'm, I'm really blanking on it, but it was something disruptive. Like she wanted to knit or something while, while class was going on because she said she needed to engage in, in two activities at the same time. And it was kind of weird and disruptive, and I didn't, and I didn't allow it at that, at that point. But that was also not an accommodation she was getting through our Office of Disability Services. So I, had, I think I had some discretion with it. So, but it's definitely, a, um, have, have you had a situation where you had to say no to a student?
Um, if the student hasn't disclosed their, their disability to other students in the class, I think I would be very careful about telling other students that that student has a particular disability. I think I would consult with the Office for Students with Disabilities before I did that. Um, I think, and then I think that if it's something that's, that's, that, that really is distracting to other students, you find that, um, I mean, it, it, might, it might be worth it for you to let the student do it for one class and then to arrange a time to talk with the student, maybe just after class when other students aren't around. Um, and then based upon how distracting it is, say, well, I don't, I don't, we can do that, you can continue to do this, or you really can't do this anymore because it seems to be distracting to other students. So I think generally that's the way I would approach it. Hmm? Sure. I think it goes, and it all goes back to the notion of reasonable accommodation. So if something is not, if a student is asking to do something and it's unreasonable, then we're pretty much not obligated to do it under the law, and it's, it's, just, it's just not good practice to do so. Um, the, the key, you know, so if a student needs to get up and move around, but it's not distracting to other students, then no big deal. But if a student has to, I remember that other student wanted to cut, um, she wanted to like cut things out or engage in some other activities, and it was a really small class and it was really distracting, and it was apparent that it was bothering other students. So she she didn't do that. She wasn't allowed to do that because that was not reasonable. So it all goes back to the notion of reasonable accommodation, and it does I think require a judgment call on the part of the instructor or the Office for Students with Disabilities. And I think if you're ever in doubt, consult with the Office for Students with Disabilities to get their take on it, because I think they're probably in the, in the best position to know and understand. <clears throat> OK. Well, we have about 15 minutes left. And I know that you wanted to give some opportunity for um, folks from uh, the university to, to talk. Can we go for another five or 10 minutes? OK. Um, I want to do this kind of think, pair, share activity. We'll do this for a couple minutes. And then I think this will be kind of our wrap-up activity. <clears throat> I know this is a scenario that some people have sort of described and alluded to this type of scenario. So we have Joshua, who's a 19-year-old sophomore with ASD majoring in political science. He's enrolled in an international relations course, which involves a substantial amount of group discussion during class. At virtually every opportunity, Joshua provides his opinions on international affairs. He often blurts out answers, dominates discussions, and becomes argumentative if others disagree with him. Joshua's opinions are politically conservative, which some of his classmates find to be offensive. His professor, Dr. Rudnick, is also offended, and although he likes Joshua, he's giving him a failing grade for class participation and a D in the course overall. This is a real situation, real scenario. Really happened. What could Dr. Rudnick have done differently to structure in-class discussions and activities to prevent Joshua's challenging behavior? And if you were Dr. Rudnick, what steps could you take in, to help Joshua be a better citizen in the course and participate productively? So how could you structure that activity, maybe a little differently, and if you were Dr. Rudnick, what steps would you take at this point to help him get on the right path? So I'll show you the scenario again. So think about that a little bit, then, then get together with a partner and then write some answers.
So first, <clears throat> what could Dr. Rudnick have done differently to perhaps structure his class to make it less likely that Joshua would be the problem, problematic student that he is? Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Good. So, ha so have some sort of policy there, and make sure you make sure that he reiterates that, or or, or states states that policy at the beginning of the semester. Good. Uh huh. Okay. 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 Good. Good. So three ground rules. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. So maybe time limits on the amount of discussion, or I would think may. And I actually I did this with a student, um, limiting the number of comments per class to say three. I had a student not with ASD, but he was a student who was very. You, sometimes you get that student who gets like fixated kind of on you and like t wants to take all of your classes. And that this guy was, was very much like that. And he would just raise his hand like constantly to, to participate. So it wasn't so much, he would have blurted out answers if I gave him that opportunity, but he always always raise his hand. And he would just dominate the discussions. And so I had to, I had to communicate a limit to that. And that was three, but it was funny because he, once he would hit his three, well, the, fir the first time I imposed it, he'd hit his three, and then he pulled out his laptop, and he started furiously typing on his laptop. And I said, okay, that works. It's kind of weird. I wonder what he's doing. And I got back into my office, and there were like seven questions that he sent to me in email. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then we had to, then we had to work through that. Um, so, so good, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Yeah. And I mean, I, so I guess we can make the we can make the assumption that and that part of it's a little fictionalized. So we can um, let's make the assumption that course participation is a relatively big portion of the course, and he's doing okay in the other assignments, but this is really dragging him down. So if we fix this, it, he would probably do OK. It also leads to the fact that the question was also offended, getting him to get a new grade, right? Well, well the question comes in, he gives you the scenario, and they say, could it be the fact that he's tall? Like, mm -hmm. the fact that he's offended by his statement, but he's failing it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and that's, part of, and that's part of the problem solving, because in this, in this um, scenario, this was a real scenario with a student who, I mean, frankly, he's you know he's a conservative kid, and you know most of his professors are, are and other students in the class don't think that way. So how does he negotiate that as a social skill, right? And I think it hi it highlights, um, you know, it, it it highlights the need for teaching or support in him learning how to tolerate others' points of view when they're different than than yours, which I think is what he. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I, th I think it's both. Um, but I think that that again, that again goes back to what could he do a little bit differently? Um, and I think that the notion of, you know, uh, stating explicitly that this is a political science course and people will have different opinions. And if someone's opinion is very different than yours, you have to respect that. And that applies not only to him, but that applies to everybody in the course. Okay, it's... Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, that's th those are really, really good, good suggestions. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's some information missing, but I'm, and I'm it's evoking some questions, but they're, they're, they're good ones. Um, because it is a troubleshooting process oftentimes. If you have to, if, if you have a situation like this, and probably most of you have encountered it, where it's maybe time to talk with a student individually, these are some tips. Um, it's a good idea to meet with the student privately because you must maintain the confidence, unless the student has told other students in the class, I have a disability. Um, you have to communicate with the student in such a way that it's not, you're not gonna disclose their disability to other students. Begin by describing what the student does well, right? So if you're, you're in the situation where, you know, you're gonna tell the student something the student's probably not gonna particularly like, but there's probably something good the student brings to the situation or the class. Okay, I appreciate your enthusiasm about the course and your participation in class, and don't say but, because when you say but, they forget everything before but. Some students in the class are offended by your comments. Okay? Describe the problem in specific and observable terms. Not, you're rude, you're being rude. We want to label the behavior and not the student. So try to identify the offensive behavior and not say, student, you're, you're, being, you're being unreasonable. No, say, <clears throat> you know, you make statements and they're, they're really offending your, your, the other students in the class. Describe specific expectations or corrective actions. Again, being as specific as possible. Please only speak when I call on you in class. If you're confused about an assignment, email me directly. Complete the study guides before you come to class. Be, be direct. And encourage the student to ask clarifying questions. Oftentimes, stating, stating the expectations very clearly with students with ASD can really solve the problem. Because the issue is not that the student is a jerk or the student doesn't want to do the work. The student just does, does not get the expectations. And then seek assistance from the Disability Support Office or Office of Students with Disabilities. Okay. All right. So we've shared some examples, and I want to do just a very brief review before we wrap up. <clears throat> and I'm not going to ask for volunteers. I'm just going to hand out response cards. So I'm, earlier I mentioned to you about response cards, and I, I couldn't bring enough for everybody on the plane. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just hand them out in a haphazard way. There you go. <clears throat> this is a very, uh, yeah, you can, you can do them in pairs if you want to. That's fine. Okay. Two. Thank you. So, I, I typically do these reviews bo either before or after, at the beginning or at the end of class. So basically, I'm going to ask a question. It's going to be on the overhead. You're going to write an answer, but you're not going to raise your. Uh, you're not going to do anything with your response card until I say cards up. And when I give you the cue, cards up, you're going to put the response cards over your head. Okay? You'll get a, after you write the answer, particularly if you're right, you'll get a strong urge to raise the response card above your head. Don't do it until I give you the signal. Here we go. Multiple choice. Who first, ter who for first coined the term autism? Was it A? Eugene Bluer, B, Leo Kanner, C, Hans Osberger, or D, Ivar Lovas.
It's a, oh, and one, one rule of response cards is you can look off of your neighbor. It's OK. You can cheat. It's fine. <laughs> cards up. Good. Most of you got it right. The correct, half of you got it right. The correct answer is A, Eugene Bluer coined, ter, coined the term autism. That one was at the beginning. One nice thing about response cards is that you can get feedback about how the majority of your students are doing with the course content. So that one was 50-50. Which of the following will be combined in the diagnostic criteria of the DSM-5? Would this be A, social and communicative deficits, B, repetitive and communicative deficit behaviors, or C, repetitive and social behaviors? Cards up. Good. Most of you got it right. The correct answer is A. Social and communicative behaviors will be combined in the DSM-5. Very good. True or false? Guided notes are an example of universal design. Cards up. Good, it's true. Almost everybody got that right. Guided notes are an example of universal design, along with an accessible syllabus, active student response activities, and the other strategies we discussed. Good. <clears throat> if a student has a document, true or false, if a student has a documented disability and requests an accommodation through Office of Students with Disabilities, the instructor can decide whether it is appropriate to provide the student with an accommodation. I should clarify that to say that the Office of Students with Disabilities has said it's okay for the student to have the accommodation. Can the instructor then decide whether it's okay for the student to, prov to provide the student with the accommodation? Cards up. Okay, good. Everybody got that one. Almost everybody got that one right. It's, oh, everyone got that right. It's false. I'm sorry. I couldn't read yours in the back there. It was a little... Your handwriting was a little small. Yes, that's false. If a student has gone to ODS, they've documented that they have a disability, and they've gotten the OK, then you as the instructor have to provide the accommodation. Multiple choice. Targeted advisement strategies are part of A, primary prevention, B, secondary intervention, or C, tertiary intervention. It's been a long day. These be primary, secondary, or tertiary intervention. Remember, primary strategies are universal, secondary strategies are targeted, and tertiary strategies are for students who really are in, in crisis. Oh. Well. Oh, I guess I did, kind of. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> That's okay. Cards up? Good B. Well, most of you got it right before I gave it away anyway. It was secondary, secondary interventions. An accessible syllabus is an example of primary, secondary, or tertiary. Cards up. Good, primary, excellent. Okay. Individual advisement strategies for students who are failing academically are part of which one? Cards up. Good. C. It's C. Tertiary prevention. Excellent. Almost everybody got that one right. Okay. If you have any questions or if you wanted to follow up with, um, with anything that we talked about today, this is my email address. Please feel free to shoot me an email. The PowerPoint's going to be posted. Sure. Yeah, sure. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I need my response cards and markers back.
<laughs> yeah. Almost all of you know uh, Mary and Michael from uh, Thank you. the Science Center. Just for talking 